I'm Allison Singer with the Autism Science Foundation here today with Dr. Fred Volkmar, the director of the Yale Child Study Center. Uh, Dr. Volkmar is the Irving Harris Professor of Child Psychiatry, Pediatrics, and Psychology, as well as being the director of the Yale Child Study Center at the Yale School of Medicine. Thanks so much for joining us today, Dr. Volkmar. Happy to be here. Uh, you have been part of the autism research field for many years. Maybe let's talk first about how the field has changed during the time that you've been involved in autism research. It's interesting. The, the good news is that there's just been a really an explosion of knowledge, which is fantastic. So that for the first time, we're really able to think about doing things that 20 or 30 years ago would have been pie in the sky. Nobody would ever have dreamed it's possible. We're thinking about genes and behavior and intervention, so that's all fantastic. Uh, at the same time, there's now so much going on, that it's hard to track all of it. What have we learned over the years about the prevalence of autism and about what causes autism? We've learned a lot about uh, how really common autism is, especially if you take a somewhat broader view of the matter. Um, that people used to focus on the sort of most classic kinds of autism. And in fact, we've come to appreciate that with early intervention, children do better and better. So there's a much wider range of functioning in later childhood, adolescence, and adulthood, which is fantastic. We also know from the studies of genetics that there's a very strong genetic aspect to autism. And now with new methods, both of neuroimaging, genetics, and animal models, we're actually starting to test out some hypotheses about what kinds of genes might translate through the brain into the behavior that we see. And what are some of the specific areas that you're studying here at the Yale Child Study Center? We're very interested in children actually throughout the lifespan into adulthood. Uh, so we have projects on children at risk because they're siblings, very young children. We have a large clinical program for children under three. Uh, we have a program of school-aged children, we're doing longitudinal studies, and we're developing some new intervention programs looking at adolescents and young adults, which interestingly has been a somewhat underserved population. And I know here at Yale it's a very collaborative program with a lot of cross-disciplinary pollination. Can you talk about how the different groups work together as teams here? It's, I think one of the things that's nice about the Child Study Center is because we're intrinsically interdisciplinary. People are part of the same department, they talk to each other, they go to the same meetings. Going around the country, I think that's one of the challenges autism programs face, is that people are often in such disparate locations, departments, it's hard to literally get people together. But here we have all kinds of collaboration from computer science, neuroimaging, genetics, intervention, so it's fantastic. And what are some of the ways that that type of collabor collaboration has led to new different types of ideas being researched or, or research being done more quickly? Well, for example, we've looked at things like what infants look at when they're looking at faces. Uh, that uses methods both from basic perceptual research, but also an informed understanding about some of the aspects of autism and the social difficulties, as well as some technology aspects. And also thinking about communication skills, because that's one aspect also of thinking about social engagement is what's the purpose of social engagement is for communication. And what is your personal area of research? Where are you specializing? I actually have been interested over the years in some of the social aspects of autism. So I've been interested both uh, as diagnostic features, but also in understanding what the brain basis of some of the social difficulties might be. And in more recent years, partly because I'm an editor of a journal as well, I've been interested in really trying to make more of an effort to translate what we know from research into the lives of children and families and schools. And what are the, the, some of the key findings that we've found in terms of the socialization aspect over the years? One of the things we've come to appreciate is how central the social deficits are, which is, in some funny way, rediscovering what Leo Connor said in the first place about the importance of autism and defining autism. At the same time, we've started to understand that there's some very fundamental deficits, difficulties in social information processing, uh, which in some ways isn't surprising because social information happens very quickly. It's multimodal, multi-channel. And what, one of the things we really have discovered is that for many of our children, in terms of the social world, they're maybe getting one-tenth of the same load of information the rest of us are. So what are some ways that parents can use the information that's coming out of the Yale Child Study Center to help their children with autism? Well, I think there are a couple of things. One is we are trying to do a better job of thinking about both translational work but also how we use uh, knowledge from studies of treatments to have a better uh, knowledge base in terms of evidence-based practice. 
Uh, I think there are some things that fall out just from what we know about autism and social information processing, which is keep it simple, keep it short, use repetition, use visual static images as much as possible, provide organizational supports, and there's really a whole range of things we can think about doing both at home and in the classroom that will help children with autism learn more effectively. Let's talk a little bit about the classroom. I know you just launched a new program where you're working specifically with schools in New Haven. How is that going and what are we learning from that? Well, we're really interested in, again, taking some of the knowledge into schools to think about how we can apply things, both in terms of research methods, but some of the implications of research methods. So we're doing a, a range of things, including looking at new methods of actually taking some of our eye tracking technology directly into the classroom so that we can really see what do children actually get when they're in the classroom and getting a lecture or talk from a teacher. I think it's fascinating that you can use eye tracking technology in a school classroom. What are some of the things that we expect to learn from that type of experiment and how will we reapply it to help children when they're in the classroom? So I think one of the questions will be some very simple structural things like does it make a big difference where the child sits? Does it make a big difference in how the information is presented? What kinds of things can we use to support the child in terms of pre-teaching or presentation methods? How can we use computers and other kinds of technology to help the child focus? So there's a range of things we can think about just in terms of the literal physical environment and also the learning supports. And I think the other thing we'll be able to see is looking at what will probably be complicated interactions of the kinds of material um, that's presented and what the child takes away from it uh, and the methods that the teacher uses in terms of presenting it. I think I, like most parents, uh are always very eager to have these data. When will we have published data uh, from the eye tracking in the classroom that parents can use to present to their own boards of education to try to get some of these implemented in their own district? Well, I wish I could say I knew for sure. We're actually just looking at the pilot's uh, uh, implementation of this little gadgets we're putting together. And uh, we've had to go into some links to sort of jerry-rig the gadgets. But uh, we're hoping this is going to be relatively inexpensive. And if we can demonstrate feasibility, then I would hope within the next year or two. Well, that's great. Well, we'll definitely look forward to seeing those data. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much.